Right then, another half day at the unit. It's bloody cold and uh, just it's not, you know, it's not airplane building weather, I'll tell you that much. Uh, I've got a heater in there, but it, it goes through about 10 quid with the diesel. And um, in like half a day, it doesn't half burn through the diesel and stuff, but uh, I ought to be putting kerosene in it or red diesel, something like that, but I just don't know where to get it from. So I pick up the, the tax diesel from the garage. So tax man wins again. Uh, trying to keep me warm but anyway we've been down there so uh, this video was about reading the fucking manual Morning. Well, it is morning. It's freezing cold again. Zero degrees, lots of ice on the road. Uh, recording on here again. Shifted it slightly so I don't get all that rattly road noise. Uh, I thought I'd have a quick catch up. I'm just on my way to Lincoln University to do a lecture, but um, I wanted to tell you about the faux pas um, with the cap strips on the aeroplane and uh, thank you Alan from South Africa who who messaged me uh, apologising for bursting my bubble but it, it seems that uh, I've not read the manual properly and I didn't realise but the cap strips aren't the right width have I just moved you? I have, haven't I? the cap strips um, aren't the right width you have to trim them and I didn't know that I just assumed they'd be the right width why wouldn't they be? but um so I've got to go back through the manual and have a look at that and uh, see how, uh, how badly we've messed up. So then I'll have to make a decision as to whether I take that cap strip off again. I've only put the one on. Um, whether I take it off again and, and just start from the beginning or whether I trim the cap strip that's on there. And I think the decision will depend on whether that cap strip comes off easy. And I don't think it's gonna do. So I might just end up having to trim it uh, in, in situ. Uh, we'll have a look at that, because it needs to be fairly flat, otherwise you'll, you'll get some kind of rippling uh, undulations in the, in the covering. So read the uh, flipping manual, that's what they say. And uh, it's the first job back in this year. And I think what's happened is I've just got, not got my head into that right headspace. I've just dived in wanting to get started and um, uh, I've not done the groundwork, that sitting down, reading the manual, going through it in your head a couple of times uh, that I was doing before. So that's what I'm going to do next.
cap strips taped on, I've used the tape, this time instead of the um, tie wraps, that was Alan's recommendation. Um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily easier than the tie wraps. Sometimes the tie wraps are easy because you can see more, but uh, my tape's a bit broad, so that perhaps doesn't help so much. But um, I've gone with the tape and the tape does everything. So it's taped up and epoxy slapped on everywhere. Uh, we're getting a little bit tidier, um, being tidy in the shop up, we've got some chipboard up, slowly starting to assemble the tools. Uh, so that we're a bit more organized because we are in a bit of a mess. see this all right so I've just taken the, the light away uh, to show you something else but uh, these take a bit of work so these are the ribs of the cap strips and on the last video I showed you this cap strip here where is it um, that I'd put on and um, this is about reading the uh, the effing manual um, it's in the instructions that you cut these cap strips in half and I missed it uh, just one line so easy and I think the reason for that is you you get into the um, I got off the build I came back into the build uh, carrying things in my head and didn't I haven't got myself immersed in the airplane enough at that stage and a lot of that is reading the manual rereading it planning ahead and um, uh, the, during the last stint a couple of months ago, I was uh, constantly reading and rereading the manual and I haven't done that this time because I've just started back into it, but um, mistake realized. So we've uh, addressed that, we've cut these in half. Um, it takes a bit of work because what I'm trying to do is, uh, it's easy to put the cap strips on, but it's where they meet uh, the leading and the trailing edge because that's kind of got to be smooth the the fabric is going to come off here and wrap around the front and they need to kind of be the same um, and it needs to be smooth and with no sort of ridges at the front so there's been a little bit of um, epoxy work and sanding it and reapplying a bit of epoxy just to fill fill the bits in and uh, you can see here this one's a lot neater um, 
that's quite smooth that, that didn't need any extra work you'll see uh, during the sanding process using a, a flat sander uh, we've taken off this uh, this undercoat here but that doesn't matter we'll uh, we'll paint that back in um, and uh, we've been applying a little bit more here this is kind of a second coat you see again I've scutched the, the paintwork, but that's fine. Um, this edge, the leading edge, uh, is the is the easier part. Um, it's well, it's not the leading edge actually. That's um, that's the trailing edge. The trailing edge. I do apologise. It's the easy bit. It's the leading edge. Um, that's the challenge, and you can probably see there's a few tie wraps. They, uh, it's much sharper angle as it comes over, and it's difficult to get the cap strip to follow that contour without springing up. Um, so I've done the best I can. I find the best thing to do is to trim back a little bit further the cap strips, and then I'm just forming with a epoxy resin. A little bit of a mess, but it's masked. And the idea is we get nice even contours with a little bit of sanding. Um, but that's all going good. That's uh, that's that. Uh, this paintwork as well and the cap strips, there's been a lot of bit of sanding on them now. You remember that I applied uh, a two-pack clear coat to these uh, to seal them. Now, it needs to be two-pack. I think there's an issue with varnishes that are not two-pack with them softening the glue. So it needs to be hardened um, varnish. Um, and so what I'm gonna have to do now is when I've actually uh, primed this, I'll need to go over with uh, two packs. So I'll, I'll be spraying, uh, I might, well, we'll undercoat that and then I'll probably just two pack over the top of this paint uh, and over here, just to provide hardened, uh, well-attached surface for the glue to stick to so that's going to be another job uh, the black stuff's a little bit messy as we said I've been toying with the idea of uh, just abrasive wheeling some of this up and cleaning it up I uh, probably will do we'll do that when when we finish slapping epoxy everywhere so so far so good uh, I think the it looks messy but the finished item I think will be both sound and uh, look a lot neater. Uh, this epoxy resin is really interesting stuff. I, I guess, you know, that the people that designed this aeroplane when they chose the epoxy resin, there's a lot of engineering reasons behind different resins. What I found is it sticks like shit to a blanket. I mean, it really does adhere and bond well to the surface that it goes on. I did clean this surface up, of course, with, with degreaser. Um, but when I've been sanding it, I've noticed, when I've been pulling it around, uh, it's actually a little bit flexible. It's not rock hard like some of the epoxy resins. Um, it's got sort of a, a slight rubbery flex texture. And I guess that's uh, to absorb vibration. If the resin's hard, um, a lot of the energy that's passed through in the form of uh, vibrational energy will, will get transferred into the molecules and cause them to break, uh, and break apart. But when it's soft, um, it'll transmit the vibrations through uh, and then none of the uh, none of the energy does any work on the actual uh, epoxy itself to break it so that's interesting stuff if you're interested in that geekery um, there's a reason behind that resin so you can't just use any resin uh, to glue it on otherwise you'll end up with it uh, just shearing and and snapping and that won't be useful at 6,000 feet over the peak district Right, next bit then, ne next mistake. That was one mistake, the cap, st cap strips. Next mistake, we've got a bit of light on here now. Um, chucking some light onto the job. Uh, I noticed this myself, nobody else had noticed it. The cap strips, other people had noticed and told me. Uh, here is an obvious error. What's the obvious error with the joystick? Yep. I noticed this watching some of Thomas Marrow's videos. Uh, they're the wrong way around. This angle goes forward. I don't know why. It just seemed uh, it seemed to make sense for it to go that way when when I put them on. Didn't think about it hard. Uh, it wasn't obvious in the manual. I don't believe unless I go back and read it and find out I've overread something else. But 
Uh, I noticed it watching other people's videos and I guess that's going to be in the knackers <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you try to take off or flare for a land. So uh, I've got to swap those round. So hopefully those drill holes that I did are perfect, um, perfectly perpendicular. Otherwise I'll end up with a slightly off angle uh, joystick. So I'll be swapping those round. first one was drilled perfectly so they swap round um, it's just having making sure that that hole was definitely uh, perpendicular um, because if it's out slightly then when you twist it round and put the other one in um, it, it will double the angle that you've uh, you've drilled in correctly and that one was perfect. This one was slightly out. I mean, slightly, but of course it doubles it. So if it was out by two degrees, you get a four degree variation. So what I did was I've just, I, I just opened out the hole uh, on the control stick itself, just slotted it slightly, um, each hole, and that gave it a little bit of rotational play, um, which doesn't matter because once you actually tighten these down, uh, you put a little bit of de yeah, deformation pressure on here uh, and it grips and it has done. This was a, another good reason to dry fit. As you remember, these are all dry fit at the moment. There's no nylocks on there or AM bolts or anything like that. And a uh, good reason for dry fitting because you come across these issues. So they are now correct, unless Thomas Marrow's got his wrong. Um, but I'm sure he hasn't. So, um, uh, so that's good. Perfecto. Uh, that was quite a quick job. So, mistakes, um, but rectifiable is part of the fun. It is part of the fun. Thing then I bought this little puppy um, it's an iron for doing the wing covering digitally controlled so how do we do it let's just turn it on and it's heating what we're gonna set the temperature that's at 200 let's bring that down how low does it go how low do you go Goes down to 100 degrees. Right. Let's heat that up. Then I'm going to test it with this. And to be honest with you, it's like the blind leading the blind. So um, 28 degrees. If if that says 100 degrees, that says 90, which is more accurate because this is just cheap. Cheap too. I guess if they both correlate, I'll feel uh, confident. I could uh, calibrate this on a boiling kettle. So we have to have um, digitally controlled. We, we need to know what the temperature is. People do all sorts of things with hand irons and things like that, measuring the temperature. But you know, um, buy this digitally controlled. So that says 100. Let's just see if it stays. I'm going to turn it over. Now, when you when you test an iron, you never test it on a reflective surface. So let's just 114. Let's try it again. 13 degrees out, but. Probably have to calibrate it. Oh, that says 108 now. Let's just let it settle. I did when I um, read some reviews. They did say that it, it kind of went over temperature, heated itself up, and then lowered the temperature down 
and then stabilized. So let's see what happens. Um, Hundred and one. That says ninety seven. That's a hundred. That says a hundred and two. There's a bit of variation on the old digital thing. Um, right, that's stabilizing the hundred. Let's just whip it over. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, a hundred. So that's saying a hundred, and that says a hundred. Well, I reckon then that's probably um, it's probably about right. Right, I'll turn that off. Off. Nifty. Bit of an eye in for ironing your clothes or aeroplane wings. Now my advice to anybody watching these videos is if you're watching and you're copying, uh, try and watch a couple of videos ahead because I'm very honest about what I do and I show you what I'm doing as I do it, warts and all. I don't claim to be any kind of an expert, I'll learn as I go along and I make mistakes and I often don't realize I've made a mistake at the time of posting the video so if you watch the video you'll think oh that's how you do it and I'll do the same and then a video or two later you'll uh, you'll realize or I'll realize that there's been a mistake made and then I'll let you know about the mistake so try and be about two videos ahead if you can help it if you are following along um, Posting the videos is quite useful. It does two things. One, I guess it's kind of it's kind of helpful to anyone else who's wanting to go through the same process, even with the KFA or even with the you know, right Max, even with a different aeroplane. I guess you've got an interest, and, and it can be helpful to let you know what's involved. But it's useful to me as well because I post these videos and there's a few guys, particularly out there in South Africa, who have been through the whole process and they spot the mistakes and uh, uh, they, uh, they like to send me, they like to send me little uh, voicemails saying, hey Sean, you fucked up there mate. So there we go, wing kit coming, as I keep mentioning, about a week away, 10 days away. Next kit then I think is going to be the finishing kit. Uh, there's a few bits and pieces in that, um, including the seats, not quite ready for them yet. We've got to start the covering as well on the inside of the aeroplane. There is the luggage bay is, is coated with a uh, with skin and then that skin can be covered in carpet and I think that's a good place to start learning the whole process of covering. Uh, because a lot of the sins on that internal fabric work will be hidden by gluing carpet on the inside. Uh, it's not going to be seen and there's no sort of requirement for that to be airworthy at all. It's just really forming uh, walls on the inside of the, of the luggage compartment. I bought the iron. Um, it's kind of a iron for using the fabric and I'll be going through the whole process of how we lay down this fabric fairly soon. I've been watching a lot of videos myself, uh, I've also been reading the manual on how it's done. Um, I think I've got the process sorted out in my head but there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of learning to be done. I was told by uh, other people that have covered their aeroplanes that when you first start doing the job uh, the workmanship's a little bit ropey and as you go along as you finished, you do your last thing, it looks bloody good, and then you look at your early work and you're not happy with it. And some people say they end up actually recovering stuff that they uh, that they started doing. So I think there's a bit of a learning curve, but I look forward to that as well. Um, I am looking forward to starting doing a bit of covering because I think that uh, 
that will start to make it look more airplane like and not like a climbing frame. Hey, if you like these videos, please hit the subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, that helps the old YouTube al algorithm. And until the next time, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.